Here's another video about Mushoku Tensei. This one's called Why Mushoku Tensei is a master class in character writing. And I do not disagree with that. I agree. Mushoku Tensei is an objectively well-written story. But my goodness. Mushoku Tensei Season 2 Part 2 has the best writing in any anime ever. MT is the best isekai of all time. I don't think you can actually definitively ever say that. These are just opinions, but hey, let's listen to why it's a great masterclass of a writing piece. Mishoku Tensei has the biggest variety of characters you'll see in anime. From a Is Mushoku Tensei the anime with the most variety of characters? What did he just say? Characters you'll see in anime. I think these are all... Listen, I understand the glades, right? I agree, MT is a great show, but... I think a lot of people just like throw around these like absolute terminology of like, yep, this has the best writing, this has the best characters. It's like, how could you possibly say that when these are just opinions and there's plenty of other isekais that matches their level of depth of the characters or the diversity of the show? From a deadbeat father to a Mr. Beast employee to even throwing in Charmander, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur. That's but it's true. time for That's me to true. tell you that Mishoku Tensei does not have the best characters in Isekai. Oh? What? What? Hold up! Subverted expectations? What do you mean? Because it has the best characters in anime. That's just cap, though. That's like... Listen. I love Mushoku Tensei, and I'm coming into this video with a very genuine way of having to wanting to have a discussion and conversation about why it is. But like, you can't just say, "Yep, this anime best characters in all anime." Yep, it's like you can't just say that. You can say it's one of, but there is no definitive best. And at the end of the day, this up uh, this objective absolute turn of best. It's simply just people's opinions and what they feel. There's no way to quantify or analyze like how to differentiate this from other isekais. And I'm gonna prove this by diving into how Mishoku right. Tensei's world affects the characters as well as explaining the tragic truth behind the character's relatability and then decide who is the best Mishoku Tensei character. It's not I mean, like, I, I bet this video is gonna be great in understanding different characters, but again, it's just like, how could you possibly claim that it's just the best characters in all of anime? Now that we just set up the boundaries for you guys to go at it in the comments like My Hero fans when they realize their ending is shit, let's just jump into it. So Not Mishoku five, Tensei is one of those anime that blew up onto the scene. Between Gigik hyping this up to be the greatest piece of media since we created Ink, everyone went in with pretty high expectations. And after watching it, it's impressive how everyone's favorite part of the series could be completely different. Some people may love the characters, some people may love the story, the twist, the turns, and unfortunately, some people may watch it for the girls. For fuck's sake, man. If you're watching and you're a viewer of me watching for the why, why, why foods? Please get some help and leave a like, comment, and subscribe and tell me who your favorite character is down below. But seriously, there is just a lot to be obsessed with when it comes to Mishoku Tensei. Sure. And now you may be thinking, hey, dipshit, this video is about characters. Why are you talking about the world? Well, 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 listen here, Rem Lover 321. What if I told you the world is what makes these characters so great? I the world building is simply character development kept it written like character development is simply a byproduct of good world building or you could say that vice versa because of the depth of the world different regions where characters come from they're also rich lore like roxy's just some not some random girl she's from the demon continent right there's rich lore and different cultures to explore and that's why mushoku tensei i think has an incredible depth of characters i know I know. You see, anime worlds most of the time have nothing to do with anything. They're merely a setting for the story to take place, something to isolate a period of time, or in some cases, they're essential for the plot to move forward. And Sometimes the setting does seem arbitrary, like there is no reason for these settings to happen. But some other shows where the setting is intentional, and again, with that deep culture or background of each character from those settings, you can then create even better variety of roster. And in the case of Mishoku Tensei, the world is everything, and although this video is arguing that its characters are the best in anime, you could easily make a video on why the world is the best in anime, which... Yeah, I mean, again, I, it, it's arguing, right? It's like, I want to say, like, I think that it's the best because of these reasons, right? But you can't just say this is the best, because at the end of the day, we're all monkeys. 
There's no quantifiable scientific approach in analyzing in a, like, again, with empirical data, what could you possibly assess, right? At the end of the day, these are works of fiction. And a lot of it has to do with just subjective vibes and feelings. Of course, if more people think that this show is better than some other shows, then there might be a good reason. But at the end of the day, popularity also doesn't mean shit because there's more fucking stupid people in the world than smart people. There's more fucking monkeys in the middle of the fucking pack than there is the super intellect, pseudo intellect, right? So it doesn't just mean just because what Demon Slayer is super popular. Is it the fucking best anime or is it the best show? No, it just means there's a lot of more fucking kids watching this show compared to actual pseudo intellects that think that, you know, other shows are better. So I just think at the end of the day, this topic or discussion of like, what is the objective best anime? That is already the wrong question to ask. You can say, I think it's in competition for one of the best because of these reasons. And let me know why. Or else you can't just fucking put a crown on it. Why is it the best? Let me know if you want to see that down below, but in this situation, what it does for the characters can't be understated, and it's also what allows their flaws to be accepted. Characters like Paul and Eris literally do not work without the world that's been built up. So let's jump into those two, because although you could say All this right. about any character in any anime, with these two, the world elevated them to becoming some of the best in the medium as a whole, and that is no exaggeration. What? Due to the Mana disaster, both sides obviously were separated and they went through so much more different tragic stories and their whole character development is based off of that initial Mana disaster and the separation and trying to meet their family. Paul, though, is seen by some as the lowest of the low. Everyone just be hating on Paul. They be calling him a deadbeat. Oh, he a cheater. Paul is a deadbeat alcoholic who cheated on his wife, yes, but I still think that he's a fantastic character because he's a very realistic character of a flawed father trying his best, overcome with such extreme situations where he goes into depression and even lashes out at Rudy, who seems to be just perfect, right? I think that he is a deadbeat again. He is a trash dad. He's an alcoholic, but this doesn't mean that he's not a, like a well-written character. He's a very well-written character. Oh, he hard on Rudy. But fuck all that. Paul is the OG of all OGs, and he deadass the only good father in all of anime. Like, y'all need to stop talking back. The only good father in all of anime. I mean, that's just... Come on, man. We, this is so disingenuous, man. Paul is one... I can name, like, fucking... That, that, you know what? Honestly, compared to a lot of the anime dads out there, Paul is really good. A lot of the dads are just deadbeat. They don't even fucking exist. They're just gone as soon as the kid is there, right? I think one of the best dads ever. And it's a very simplistic dad. Demon King Academy. Misfit of Demon King Academy. Anos' human parents. Fucking amazing. Wise man, grandchild. Now, it's not a father figure, but it's a grandfather figure. But it is still a guardian figure. He was pretty good. But you know what? Paul, <laughs> even though he's very flawed and he fucks up a lot, at least he's there trying his best. Bad on my boy Paul because RIP to the boss man on Father's Day, no less his life ended, but he went down as one of the best side characters in the series. Yeah, with I Paul, agree. it's been established that he's a former knight of the highest order and has a history with a bunch of characters, both good history and bad history. And it's clear, although he cheats on his wife, considering the setting of the world, it's not uncommon of people of this period to cheat. Yeah, monogamy is only existing like the faith of Millith, and we're not really followers of Millith, and that's why it doesn't really fucking matter, right? And although this was unclear in the anime, he did actually marry Lilia after the whole incident, but Paul also uses some of the functions of this world to help Rudis when it comes to sending him away to Eris, because Paul is also a member of a super important family. Not Ray to rats. mention, Paul's whole character arc when it comes to his relationship with Rudis, Nor, and Aisha, Lilia, his new crew, and of course Zenith, it's all completely different because of the massive event that happened in the world that affected every single character in the series, and the vastness and range of this world in terms of land, transportation, guilds, dungeons, and just the character characters finding one another, they're all quintessential to his character. Every time Paul is on screen, it's like flexing on everyone that yeah, this world is absolutely insane and it's real. And those systems we introduce matter. His lineage matters. Distance matters. Time matters. And there's nothing any of y'all trash ass anime can do that can compete with our world. I mean, is... I have no doubt that Mushoku Tensei has great world building. If not, the best. I think that it's in contention for the best. Is there really no other animes that can compete on this level of writing, though? Is there really? In all of anime. Like, I'm not disagreeing. It's fucking peak. But can you really say it is the objective best? There's nothing... Like, when you say best, you're basically saying 
there is no competition. It's in a league of its own. When you say Mushoku Tensei, you can't even compare any other anime. But already, I think that, like, One Piece <laughs> world building. <laughs> ReZero world building, I think, is pretty good so far, even though I'm only on season one, episode 13 so far. But again, it's just like, I don't know. It feels very counterproductive. When, cause like when you say inflammatory shit like this, and obviously, you know, he's memeing here and has a bunch of funny pictures and tries to, you know, startle the audience and, you know, you got some mad angry faces, right? We're getting rage baited. But like, this is only going to piss off the people that you haven't convinced yet. Of course, your own audience that eats this shit up, that are just licking Mushoku Tensei's asshole and glazing it every day are going to agree with you no matter what. But it's kind of counterproductive in trying to compel a wider audience that has yet to been, you know, <laughs> propagandized that way. And this is just, again, like working in a backward way where it pushes away that audience and you're just gatekeeping instead of trying to convince them why this is the case. This anime can do that can compete with our world. There, there's some anime that can compete with it, but you could argue it is the hey, best world. Is. I could go. Yeah, I, 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 I think you can argue it's the best world. I agree. I agree. Go on about Paul and his themes, but that would also be a whole nother video. So I think y'all have learned to put some respect on his name if you didn't already. But when it comes to Eris, Let's be honest. Yeah. When she was introduced, it was like, holy fuck, man. What happened to my chill ass story we were watching before? We were Honestly, Eris just like spiced things up immediately. I loved her fire personality. I'm sorry. I'm kind of bored of just like calm, nice little girls who behave nice like Sylphie, bro. I want a little fucking toxic gremlin to show up and fuck me up. This nice little slice of life adventure watching our boy Rudis. He was just doing his thing. Like, oh, nah, he not learning magic. We learning magic. And it's like, nah, he, he a little scared of the outside world. But Roxy, Roxy gonna bring his ass outside and we're gonna deal. And this is why Rudy could never survive in ReZero. Oh, my poor fee wings get hurt. I could never imagine this fucking Rudeus with this fucking mentality trying to get fucking surviving ReZero. Ain't fucking happening. With that issue now and everything was real calm. We we're dealing with real small issues and nothing was too intense. And then Eris comes in and it's like, Jesus Christ, this story gets this level of intensity out of Good. absolutely nowhere. And a Good. lot of people thought she was really annoying at first. And to be honest, she was. Yeah, she is a bitch. Go on, I'm not gonna lie. She comes out so hostile and volatile, but it's entertaining. Buzz. But she's another character where the context of this world is huge in understanding her as a character. <sighs> where is he? This guy. Salute. He's a furry for sure. I like them. Unfortunate what happened. World is huge in understanding her as a character. And if you take the world out of her character, she is also kind of like nothing. Like that kind of is all she got besides. If you take the world out of her character, that's all she got. But that's the story. And that's how she was set up to be written. It's unfair to reduce Eris down to think like if the world didn't... What does that mean, you know? It, like, listen to what this, this just said. Fujin understanding her as a character. And if you take the world out of her character, she is also kind of like nothing. Like that kind of That's every character. Because that's how the story was meant to be written. Like, if the author didn't want to build Eris, like, when he says the world, I'm thinking, like, mana disaster. I'm thinking, like, being sent into different places and having a reason to come back. But you realize by the time that we're almost back, Grandfather Saras or something has already been assassinated. And there's a bunch of politics going on. And it makes her also realize how insecure and weak she is as she faced Orsted and gives her a reason to, like, go with Yelaine and somewhere else and train and shit like that, right? Like, I get it that the event of the mana disaster and then being sent to expand the world and explore the world is like what drives these characters but that's the whole point of the story like i yeah, if you take the story out of the character there's nothing like what, what do you mean that that is the story like that's how it's set up and it is all she got besides like in rudis wait a minute who are you when she's introduced we just just say that about every character literally apply that concept to most characters in Mushoku Tensei, where the story is driven by exploring the world and getting to know more, it's nothing because that is the story. You understand her position and her standing that she's really privileged and annoying and feels everything should be handed to her. And then there's a moment where someone is literally killed in front of her and she mm. doesn't even react. And Rudis is sitting there like, what, like, what, like, what, 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 doggy is dead. Yeah, 
Rude is a fucking bitch. Eris is used to this, I think. And he is dead. Like someone just died in front of us. But she doesn't even react. Gillian Giga in this world, it's normal for a noble to not really give a shit about anything else. And death happens all the time to everybody. But then the world affects her even more because she has to train magic and swordplay because as a noble, you do have to compete for power struggles and assassination attempts. But it's normal. It's not like this is unique to her. And when Turning Point happens, she goes from having every single thing in the world to, to having nothing it. at all and learning what it's like to live with other people and actually yeah. care for others. Yeah. And see how the consequences of the events of the story is driving her character? That is not the world. That's just the fucking story. That's a driving factor in Mushoku Tensei. Besides yourself, and throughout this whole progression of part two of season one, you see the world bounce off her and change her perspective on things as you see a privileged character all of a sudden become someone that wants to improve and be better. Then you have that moment where they return, only to find everything she loved was gone, and oh her family boy. was killed, which leads her to leaving Rudis to go and be stronger on her own. If you don't get why the world matters to her character, literally every single thing that happened to her character, from getting kidnapped to teleport to her family dead was a product of world events that wouldn't that's just a story like why is this unique to Eris the world of like like this is just the way that Mushoku Tensei is doing storytelling it, ex it, it like every character is impacted by this have hit as hard if Mishoku Tensei didn't take the time to build up its world that then set up these characters so well. Eris yeah. and Paul are two characters that in any other- I don't think these two characters are exclusive to the world building affecting their writing because Mushoku Tensei is affected by the world building and the writing. That, that's it. Their anime could have been static and annoying, but the world beats them down and tears them apart only I for agree. them to seek out aspects of the world they're in to build themselves back up. They weren't the trash they were before, but instead they are characters with complex morals and desires. Sure. Well, I guess Eris does just really want to be Lucas's third wife. Yeah, I think the argument here is that obviously... Probably Eris and Paul, well, his argument here is that Eris and Paul shine the most because of the event that's happened in Mushoku Tensei, which is the world building, right? Getting Mana Disaster and then getting out into the fucking wild and coming back home and adventuring and finding different places and going through different events and that builds their characters from what they used to be into what they are now. Yeah, I, guess, I could see that. I could see that. But it came from a place of complexity. And with that being said, it's time to understand the darkness of all these characters and the real tragic reason behind why all these characters are loved and just how relatable they are. I'm just going to address this again here fully. Mm. But I think it's going to be weird to talk about Rudis being relatable. Rudis is not a relatable character to me. You know who is relatable? Subaru. And that's probably why I already cried in ReZero, because I was so able to empathize with them and his struggles. But Rudy, watching Mushoku Tensei, I'm not gonna lie, guys. I thought that he was a pathetic loser. He's a pathetic, degenerate loser that gets a lot of second chances and continues to fuck up. But it's a real story. And I can understand and appreciate that even if I'm not relating to this guy because I'm just not that guy. When you know all that creepy stuff he got going on. And a lot of people talk about this scene and they're like, yes, you're supposed to be disgusted by him and what he does and think he's a... Rudy for real is probably one of the most relatable characters behind Subaru. And here is another chatter self-reporting and how I view you guys. Absolute pathetic losers that think that Rudius and all the degenerate shit he does is passable because he's just like you, right? Mm-hmm. I know you. I know every single one of you. I don't think I'm holier than thou, but definitely shows like Mushoku Tensei makes a lot of degenerates get gravitated towards that show because who is the main character? What kind of character is the main character? Why is this show so beloved? Because there's a lot of pathetic degenerate losers like Rudy out there that can relate to that guy and sees themselves in them. But at the same time, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's all about the redemption story. It's about understanding those faults and flaws, but being able to challenge them and having a second chance in this world and overcoming those challenges to become a better person. That's the whole fucking story. And I appreciate that. But like, when you say that you're, you find Rudy relatable, like, yeah, you probably do. Cause I, I think that most of you guys watching this shit, come on now, let's be honest here. Piece of shit. And this scene is what convinces you he's a bad guy. Look, I thought he was a loser beforehand. He Agreed. I thought he was a pathetic loser from the fucking beginning. He was literally worshipping Roxy's shit. Like, we all knew he was a creep before this scene. All this scene did was make us all feel uncomfortable and question if we should continue watching the show. So long. Pretty much. And there's multiple events after that 
where you think he's changed, but he always falls back to his degenerate habits. And I guess it makes him more human, right? A lot of people make mistakes. Rudy makes mistakes. We are not perfect. We are imperfect, irrational beings trying to figure it out. Long story short, when we talk about Rudis being relatable, we're going to be talking as if some of those scenes don't exist as much because nobody relating to that except... Nah, there's a lot of people that proudly admit this, but they do it without realizing that other people don't think that. So it's like these fucking losers of society thinking that this is a fucking safe space. They're like, oh, Rudy's me. And then a bit other people are like, what? Excuse me? And they're like, uh, never, never mind. Yeah, but besides Rudus, a lot of people forget that characters like Roxy and Norn are some of the most tragic characters in the series. That Roxy and Norn are some of the most tragic characters in the story? Paul's more tragic, is he not? Norn tragic? Norn's a little bitch. I hate Norn, but I love Norn. I love how she shit on Rudy and Roxy at the finale of season 2 and... Is Norn that tragic? I think there's a lot more people going through more shit than Norn, but she's a child that lost her dad now. Her mom's a vegetable. The relationship with their big brother is getting better. But definitely, a child thrown into the wilderness like this? Yeah, she's pretty tragic. She's pretty tragic. Rougiard? <laughs> now that's tragedy. <laughs> Rougiard? Oh, now that? Bro! Holy shit, he killed his own son, didn't he? But this weapon is literally his son's spine. Yeah, that is tragedy. Roxy, how is she tragic? Um, Couldn't speak her uh, demon culture's language. Was an outcast. There was a whole episode dedicated towards Roxy and her parents. And that was sad. Absolutely. That was, that was tragic. But like, ruiz your bro. <laughs> but like... <laughs> Honestly, Rudy is pretty tragic too. Because, like, Rudy is living through all these shitty events that we're talking about. Like, Rudy is involved in all these different shitty events. Hmm. I have many stories that many will relate to because of how real their characters can feel. Right? Yeah, I think Norn is a very realistic character. I think Norn gets a lot of shit on it because she's so realistic. Because she's an annoying child. Children are supposed to be annoying. But you can also understand why she's annoying and why she lashes out due to the insecurities, you know, being casted over as like a shadow because her big bro's just him. Roxy's a character that gets understated a lot because the highlight of her depth came at a shorter part of an episode. But when you think about the, the fact that episode. nobody wanted to communicate with her because she couldn't communicate with them and how long she's actually been alive and how long she was isolated, you mm. understand that like, hold up. She must have been pretty damn alone for most of her life. And although she eventually left, it wasn't because she was excited to leave home, but it was because she was searching for one. And she would go house to house, kingdom to kingdom to teach others magic just in order to find kinship with somebody due to the fact that she never had that. Now, I think we all have had some friend or known somebody that we just kept in the group because we knew they wanted to be there. And they're... I think that's more cruel than if anything. You giving them a fake sense of reality. You giving them a fake sense of friendship. Cut that shit off, bro. Let them fucking learn how to survive. That is, <laughs> I don't know, bro. Whenever it's it's so ugh, it's so sad, man. And you want to be nice and get them included, but at the end of the day, if it was just you two hanging out, you know for a fact you wouldn't hang out with them. I think it's more mean to act nice and make them feel like they're part of the group rather than giving them a dose of reality and them to actually find meaningful, fulfilling relationships. That's not a fucking facade to make them feel better for a short term's notice, man. They're often a friend that we may not make fun of or jump around to tell them what's going on in our lives. Is that Roxy right now? But we can tell that just inviting them to things is enough to make them really happy. And that's Roxy before meeting Rudis, just looking for something to latch onto. Mm. And with that in mind, her actions at the end of season two make much more sense. Now yeah? How did they make a lot of sense? Okay, the actions of season two. Okay, let's hear it. Now, shout out to the light novel readers. Yeah. Because most of the time, we as anime onlys hate those peak pesky bum scum of the earth manga is better crowd. Finally. No, I, I, again, right, I totally agree. There's, there's so many people that are manga light novel readers that are just absolute pathetic losers that they are willing to spoil and gatekeep their material if it means pissing people off and new people joining their community because they themselves want to feel special. Or the read light novel bros, like, I'm not gonna read, what do I look like? Shakespeare, read a book? Only LeBron reads books. But in this case, the light novel readers educated me on the fact that Roxy 
got done real dirty in season two because she yeah. got a lot of stuff removed and this is not major spoilers by the way but roxy getting labeled a cheater is officially declared unfair because why so here's my logic as an anime only that also watched some cut content from anime news regarding why the intercourse needed to be done but i i think the main point of contention is the intercourse right like why did you need to fuck the depression out of him there's many different ways to just support him well First things first, I guess Roxy was rizzed up. You could see that, right? She was infatuated with Rudy as soon as he saved her, right? And there's a lot of cute moments and a lot of, you know, um, affectionate moments between the two. But the actual core reason of why the intercourse happened is because Tallhand literally told her. Back in the day, there's no psychologist. There's no therapy. And in order to get over trauma, in order to get over these things, Quite often, an intimate act of intercourse is the way to just do it. And that was one passage in the light novel that proved that. And I was like, you know what? That's good enough a reason for me. But why does, not, why does this not count as cheating, right? Because Rudy is in a relationship with Sylphie and there's a kid on the way. Roxy fucked the trauma out of Rudy and Rudy never really asked for it. So why is Roxy absolved from the guilt of cheating? Because I think that she cheated. I think that Rudy and Roxy... They cheated on Sylphie together. Absolutely, this happened. But what is the logic that counters this? In the light novel, it was said that Rudis was sat there like a mummy, not wanting to talk to anybody for weeks until okay. Elenis told Roxy. Yeah, here's the, here it is. Eddie and Eddie and Tallinn, they had the conversation. Go fuck the depression out of him. To go and save him. So Roxy did just that. Because okay. she wanted to help him and be of use to him because okay. he has helped her so many times in the past when he was younger at home. So far, everything is consistent with that I'm thinking. Okay, so what though? Home and accepting her. So it all makes sense of why she wouldn't mind being a second wife to him. Because although she does love Rudis, what she's really looking for is a place to call home and a time to be of use to somebody. And there's a lot of people out there that are just floating at sea waiting for somebody to save them. Trying to grasp at anybody or anything. Come on. Because they feel like they aren't accepted anywhere they go. And they've given up the desire to be accepted. But... That, this is a lot of yap right now that has no logic and why this does not count as cheating. I agree with what he's saying. He's going off right now. Explaining the psychology, the situations, the empathizing moments of these people like Roxy and Rudy. But like, why? You can't just like say all this shit. I agree. But like, why does the cheating part gets nullified? instead just want to be of use to somebody so they feel their existence matters that's so what, what? is to roxy and god damn holy shit i can't believe i wrote that like that's some serious shit man and like if you're sad and is you relating to that real heavy go check out dr k he he gonna be you're stalling right now but explain to me why it's not counting as cheating you're messiah but with that being said norn also mirrors many of the same you literally skipped it you literally yapped and then made a little joke about go see Dr. K. There is no logic that you provided that counters why Roxy fucking Rudy's depression out of him doesn't count as cheating. Just because she wants a place to belong? I agree. The whole part he popped off there. I agree. But like, so what? Where is the logic that connects that empathy, that psychology of those people wanting for a place to long for, wanting to be accepted, doesn't count as cheating? That's no excuse. You're just telling me what's going on in their minds, but they still fucked and he had a wife and a kid on the way. It's that, like... Listen, Roxy cheated. And I'm okay with that. Because I'm totally fine with Rudy having multiple wives. Because Paul did. And Paul's a piece of shit. And Rudy's a piece of shit. And honestly, it was one of Paul's last dying words of advice as a father saying, Hey, son, sometimes y'all need two swords. And honestly, that's where I stand. I don't care that Roxy cheated. But I want to, like, we should acknowledge that she cheated. Like, she fucked the depression out of him because Paul and Irina they suggested to do so. And that's perfectly fine. But like, if you're going to say she didn't cheat and you go on yapping without giving me a reason on why they didn't cheat. Come on, man. Come on, man tropes of roxy but instead i feel how she came out of it is much better than roxy did because let's be honest the grand solution to your mental health resulting in you being somebody's second wife is you know like like we ain't gonna hate on you because we ain't 
This ain't the end. The third wife is coming. Eris is right around the corner for season three. Gonna disrespect you like that, but like there's better solutions out there. You know what I'm saying? Like there's other things you can do to build yourself Job. back up. Like you don't like being a second wife should not be your goal in life in my humble opinion but like i said norn feels all the same loneliness roxy does except instead of being isolated because of her lack of ability to communicate she feels isolated because she's surrounded by comparisons of her literal skill issue yep that's what norn is she's a walking skill issue such an average mediocre sibling overshadowed by the god that is known as rudius and a very realistic character one full of insecurities and and i guess hesitancy as she can't even like accept rudy because she thinks that rudy is bad then we have to have the whole talk of why rudy isn't bad because she didn't understand why rudy beat the fuck out of you know paul back in season one right there's a lot of things where you know she is like afraid and she gets constantly compared to rudy constantly compared to aisha i get it very realistic character but again a walking skill issue brother not only that but every person that interacts with her doesn't care for her in any capacity but just wants to communicate with somebody that is related to rudis mishiku yep. tensei has created this isolation around her character within the anime you can feel this cluster phobia around her like she's being surrounded and choked by everything going on all the comparisons to her brother you feel that weight on her of just all the comparisons and comparisons and it's like atlas holding the world together because she's just reminded of her her own imperfections time but kind of the beautiful thing of how she gets over this is how even though she got compared over and over and every other character speaks about you know rudy's greatness they also speak about how rudy's a good person and that's the defining moment here when rudy is waiting outside in front of her bed right and rock and norn is all fucking closed up and then she realizes that huh Rudy kind of looks like Paul right now. He's also going through this shit. And other people have vouched for Rudy, so maybe I should trust him. I'm in time again, and you know there's going to be that moment. That moment where that one comment is going to hit her too hard, and it's all going to come crumbling down. And although her conversation with Rudis is a resolution, Mishoku Tensei does this well time and time again, because they know just one stupid conversation isn't going to magically make you okay. We see this time and time again in anime. A character dies, and the main character is upset. Jesus. And then boom, one conversation, and all of a sudden, we're all good like we're back to where we were before like he's happy he's ready to go save the world he's ready to go be the messiah but nah mishoku tensei understands that yes norn is out of whatever spell she was in but we still don't see her all of a sudden become the most popular character in the world or start achieving things because growth takes time and just because she got back on the right track yeah i think it's a very realistic approach to how people struggle with trauma and problems and like get over it that doesn't mean all of a sudden the next day everything is going to be okay and this is true in the world and real life in so many ways because even when you get over struggle it's not like it doesn't come back at some point whether it's the next week the next month or maybe even the next day you can get hit with a wave of anxiety at any time but it's a battle every day and with the characters in this world you see them get tested time and time again so when they do grow and they do change it feels earned but with all that being said we understand norn paul yeah. eris roxy but now yeah. it's time to determine who's the best character Who of these four I think it's a little bit unfair for Eris to be in this because she does not have much screen time at all in season two, except at the fucking very end, you know? So that leaves a lot to be desired. But then you could also say, well, shit, Norm was just a kid that didn't exist at all in season one, you know? And she existed for a bit in season two. She did more in season two for sure, right? So maybe the amount of screen time shown between Eris in season one versus Norn in season one plus two is equal? I'm not really sure. But if we just consider every character here and think about who is like the most well-written and again these are all just opinions how do you scientifically conclude based on some sort of metric of like different writing mechanics mechanics like how do you like tally different things to say one is better than the other so at the end of the day i'm just gonna go with feels and vibes and my personal enjoyment of characters and i think that paul paul is the most well-written character out of all four here and maybe I'm biased to that because his character arc basically concluded. Everyone else's character arc, I don't think is really concluded yet. Eris is literally just not even back yet. When she comes back, it's going to be way more fulfilling. Norn, her character arc, if you think that her character arc is concluded by her being that, you know, a uh, problem child that's insecure and is constantly running away from her problems, but then later accepts Rudy as the brother and continues to get better, then maybe Norn's character arc is also finished. Roxy, maybe there's a little bit more left for, you know, second wife material and going forward, but 
of all four characters, I think Paul is the best written character for me. He is, again, a, such a realistic father who is flawed, who is not perfect, but is trying his best. And we can see time after time how he continues to struggle, but tries to be better. And at the end, you know, pour one out for Paul. He died protecting his family and had a smile. So I think that, like, it's a wonderful character arc for Paul. And I don't think that all these three characters are on the same level of Paul for me just yet. But again, I think that Paul has that boost because he fucking literally character arc is done. Like, from start to finish, it's done right now. All the other three characters, I think there's still potential. Especially Roxy and Eris. I'm not too sure about Norn anymore. But now it's time to determine who's the best character. Who's the one that stands apart the rest and brings out all these elements in the best way possible. And as much as I would like to shock you with some insane wisdom and some twists and some, oh my god, they're the best character. The best character is Rudis. And I know, I know. You made me yap for fucking five minutes because you gave me four fucking characters to pick and then you defaulted the main fucking character. Fuck you. It's the most obvious choice, but I'm not just going to pick something different. He is a well-written character. I mean, objectively, he is. Right? Because, like, everything goes through him. Literally, think about it. Every one of these characters literally get developed thanks to Rudy and interacting with Rudy. Rudy is... The main driving force. Everyone literally revolves around Rudy and his past experiences and how he overcomes it. So it's just, it's just, of course, Rudy is going to be the best written character. Oh, I know. It's the most obvious choice, but I'm not just going to pick something different for the sake of coming up with some like stupid ass logic to defend it. But just so you know, the other three I was considering were mm. Paul, Eris, and Norn. And I feel like if. Yeah. Oh, Roxy thrown under the bus. Roxy worse than Eris? Let's think about it. Season 1, Eris. She developed a lot. She changed a lot. It's because of the recency bias of Season 2. And a it's been a long time since I've seen Season 1 that I can't really think about all those Eris moments. But the more I think about it, maybe he's right. Yeah, Eris over Roxy. If we got some more scenes with Norn in Part 2, or got in a 3 episode run with Eris in Season 2, I would have been more comfortable putting in one of them over him, but that's just not the case here, and there's arguments for those characters, but we don't need to get into that. Rudis is a- I love how Sophie's not even in contention here. <laughs> so, Sophie has not been mentioned at all? Well, no, no, no. She, she has been mentioned, but not as in like a focal character of where he discusses how she's a good written character. <laughs> Based. A deplorable and loser of a character that drives a story, and oftentimes this is the type of MC that makes the story miserable to get through. Not only are they a loser, but they're also just like annoying as f Like I don't know what Tokyo Avengers think they have in Takamichi, but Jesus Christ, he is terrible, and don't get me started with Deku's bum ass. But shout out Kafka. Deck is getting a lot of shit on. Hey, Kafka's pretty good though, huh? Oh, though. Either go and check out my Kaiju No 8 video because that shit is so slept on. But I don't think I need to go on about how Rudis is the lowest of the low and that he walks on this path to redemption because let's be honest, there's hundreds of videos on that. But instead, I want to talk about how the story uses Rudis. Rudis is constantly getting things thrown at him time and time again that reflect his deepest insecurities and issues, and it's just to make Rudis feel as uncomfortable as possible at any situation. Everybody knows how important the scene was where Roxy took him outside, but what about when he's faced with the reality of the world, when somebody is killed in front of him, or when he's left to make a decision to trust Rudis or not, or when he lets someone die, or when he's trapped in a forest? There's so many times when we see Rudis put in a situation that we would never see any other anime character being put in. Where Again, like, I, I don't think this is correct. Like, you can't say that. Or when he's left to make a decision to trust Rudis or not. Or when he lets someone die. Okay. Or when he's trapped in a forest. There's sure. so many times when we see Rudis put in a situation that we would never see any other anime character being put in. We're Maybe these specific situations. Like, if the logic here is that we've never seen any other anime characters like Rudy be put into situations like this, I will agree, because it's a specific to Mushoku Tensei, and no other fucking characters is Rudy. But the analogy here is that there is no other character in anime that gets put into these situations that, where they're confronted with, like, I guess, psychological horrors of their trauma traumatic past? I haven't seen enough anime to really confirm that, right? There must be other characters that are confronted with their past, that they go through different events of their life, and... They try to overcome those. I feel like this is not a unique thing to Mushoku Tensei, but definitely amongst Isekai, 
it is probably the most unique. Like, there's no... Like, think about many... Oftentimes, Isekai characters don't even think about their fucking past. It's just forgotten immediately, and we just go around, right? Like, Wise Man Grandchild, for example, is a, it's like they, not a single fucking thought ever. Or even, like, the new Isekai we've been watching in last season that's coming in season two this season is... Uh, next season is a uh, appraisal Isekai, right? Reincarnated as an is appraisal Isekai guy. Ours never thinks about his past. Like, m most people don't. So amongst those isekais where people actually do think about their past, Mushoku Tensei definitely does it the best, I think, of all the isekais that I've seen. But really the only ones like him being Thorfinn or Eren that rival him in terms of being put in morally questionable situations. For example, Luffy is never going to be in a real situation where he needs to save one crew member over another. And I mean a true situation where one will die and one will live. But Mushoku Tensei isn't scared of doing that with Rudis. He makes hard choices all the time and we see him have to choose which family he wants to fight for. The one that was given to him or the one that he created. And we see him struggle with this decision and go back and forth deciding to stay or to go and what is right or wrong. And we know Know that Rudis is not the most morally perfect character by any means. I mean, this dude is creepy as hell, but we yep. still want to see him help everyone, and he never wants to feel alone and isolated again. But he's bound to hurt someone regardless. And what Mishoku Tensei does that makes this even better is that his choice has consequences. If he stays, he will never marry Roxy, and who knows if they would have even attempted the dungeon without him, and Paul may still be alive. But instead, this action does have consequences, and Rudis is put in a situation where he lets people down, with his only reward being a man mentally broken zenith that he traded basically his relationship with his wife potentially his father and a lot of time but should have just stayed home and cheated on Sylphie with the cat girl and the dog girl, man. That being said, he didn't want to walk away with nothing, so he wiped up Roxy on the way home. Now, Rudis's flaws are creepy, and he could be a great character without them, but he is the exact reason why Mishoku Tensei has characters and a cast that are unmatched by any other. So with that being I don't know if it's unmasked by any other, but I think that you could argue that it is unmasked by any other. And yes, you know, he is the main driving force. Every other character's relationship to Rudy, they're developed due to Rudy, right? Because as we go, you know, into character interactions and he reflects back to his trauma and then he work overcomes them, right? That plus the amazing world building in Mushoku Tensei, I think, does set it apart. Now, whenever, again, at the end of the day... <laughs> It's just, it's just fucking opinions, right? When you say that this is the best anime, you're just capping. It's simply just an opinion that you have, and there's no scientific way to literally fucking confirm that. It's all just biases and opinions, and people value different parameters in what they think makes a good anime. And I think that Mushoku Tensei is a masterclass in character writing. I agree. Mushoku Tensei is amazing. The, the character's depth and the way that each character feels so, again, deep and not cheap. They're not static characters that just exist for one single reason. Every one of them has their own different motives and dreams and aspirations. And it makes just this world so vibrant and wonderful. But I don't think it's the only isekai that does it. I think there is many different isekais that I've had the same level of enjoyment. Maybe not, you know, same level of like world building or character writing. But in terms of enjoyment, entertainment and different isekais that I think are really good. I don't think Mushoku Tensei is definitive one. I think the ReZero is getting up there. Maybe it's the recency of bias right now. Maybe I'm glazing ReZero too hard, but hey, fantastic isekais regardless. Please go check out Mr. It's Kish. He made the video. Go check his channel out. Maybe there's more interesting videos you guys can check out, and I will see y'all next time.